Hello, and once welcome once again to Gloucester Seventh-day Adventist Church Sabbath School panel. We have been going through some exciting studies over the past over the past three months, and we are now on lesson twelve, where we are looking at the covenant faith. Today, I have with me my lovely panel, Errol Westcar. Say hello. I have Richard Smith, Maria Harris and Javinia Harris. And you all know me, I'm Pastor Jackson. So today we, like I said, the topic for today's lesson is, topic for today's lesson, is, this um, Sabbath school lesson is covenant faith. And when we hear the word covenant faith, from a human perspective, or more, more to the point, from a, a modern day perspective, we, um, in today's society, the word covenant and the word faith are not words that we normally use in the same sentence. Reason being, um, when we make covenants, our agreements, we want them in writing. People always say, put it in writing, or else it has no, no weight whatsoever. Uh, a verbal covenant has little or no weight in court, in a court of law. But in God's court, in God's court, because God knows that we possess, we do not possess the necessary consideration, um, our bargaining power to repay him for what he has done or for his part of the covenant. God simply says to us, accept the, co accept the covenant by faith. And I say, praise God to that. Because what God is literally saying, what he's saying is, I will be your God. I will be your friend. I will be your protector. I will save you. I will give you eternal life. And all you have to, all you and I need to do is to accept God at his word and believe him. How awesome is that? And so we want to go to the scripture reading. The scripture reading for today is taken from Galatians chapter 3 and verse, verse 11. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. And it reads thus. It says, But no man, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. What does this mean? Because there's, there's some words in there that we, I think we need to unpack. Words like justified. What does this word justified mean? Justified means, it simply means to be declared innocent. To be declared innocent or sinless. In other words, to be seen in the eyes of God as though we had never sinned. We had never messed up. That's, 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 that is amazing. And that, um, and that, can only, that cannot be done by mere formal keeping of the law. And so in other words, what the author of Galatians is saying, Paul is saying, it is clearly obvious that no man, that no human being, you or, you or, you or me, is seen in the eyes of God as innocent on the basis of keeping the law, i.e. the Ten Commandments. But those who are justified, those who are justified, what Paul is saying, those who are justified before God are those who are living, living a life of a life of faith, and God knows who um, who has genuine uh, faith in Him. But I want us to compare. I want us to compare that text with another text. The text I want us to compare that with is Ephesians chapter chapter two, and verse and verse eight and nine. Ephesians two and verse eight and nine. It's the, the same author is 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 Paul who is writing this, and here's what here's what Paul says. Paul says in, um, in verse eight, he says, for by grace, for by grace. And here's another word that we're using and I want to un unpack these words. What is grace? Grace is unmerited, unmerited mercy or mercy that is not deserved. Mercy that is not deserved. The actual, the actual meaning of the word mercy is having compassion or showing compassion or forgiveness towards someone within whom it is within your one's power to hurt or to punish. So what it's basically saying, it is, it is within God's power to hurt or to punish us. But God, instead of hurting and punishing us, God shows us mercy. God shows us grace. And he says, so far, for by grace, we are saved through faith. Through faith. And that's faith in the death of Christ. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. And it is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Wow a free gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God. 
And verse 9 in verse 9, Paul says, not of works, not of works. So we cannot work ourselves into the kingdom. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a story in, in, in the Sabbath school lesson that speaks about um, a mystical um, Trojan um, warrior who had to fight his way. Um, it took him 10 years to get from, um, from, from, his, uh, from where he was fighting a battle. He left, the battle was finished to get home because he had to fight his way all the way home until the so-called gods decided that, you know what, it's time for him to, um, for, for, um, for him to get home. But that's not how we work with God. We have no, we cannot do any work to get ourselves into God's kingdom. And Paul says, the reason for that is lest any man should boast. Because then if I am doing 10 times more than one of my, my, my panelists on here, I'm going to say, yes, 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 I deserve to be in the kingdom. And they, they deserve to be in a lesser place in the kingdom. But God is saying it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are all on the same level playing field with Christ. But I want us to look at another text um, speaking on the same, the same, the same issue. So we compare, compare scripture with scripture. And I want us to look at Romans chapter one and verse nine, where Paul speaks about the just shall live, shall live by faith. Romans chapter one, verse nine, and then verse 15 to 17. Verse nine, Paul says, Romans chapter one and verse, and verse nine, Paul says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with, um, with my spirit in the gospel of, 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 his, of his son, Jesus Christ. So notice the word, um, the word that Paul is saying. The gospel is of Jesus Christ. The gospel is of Christ. The good news, gospel, good news. The good news is about, is about Jesus. And Paul is saying, God bears me witness that I, that in the spirit, that the gospel that I am preaching, that the gospel that I am living is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's move on. Verse 15, he says, so, the, so as, um, as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. In other words, what he's saying, I'm ready to preach Jesus to you also. I'm ready to preach at all times, Jesus. For I'm not ashamed, verse 16, of the gospel of, of Christ. Of Christ. Um, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus. And that good, the good news about Jesus is the power of God that saves. Let me go, but let me go to the, to, the, to the actual text. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of Jesus is that Jesus died and rose again and lives for you and I. Christ came and died in our place and he's our substitute. He became the substitute for us, for me and for you. So what, what that means is that he took the, he took what the debt, the, the punishment that is deserving to human beings, to you and I, to myself, because I have, um, I, I have sinned, all have sinned. So Christ came and he took the punishment that is deserving to me, to the punishment that is deserving to you. And so that then we are able to live by faith in him. And that is, and Paul is saying, that is what saves what Christ has done for us. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. In, again, Paul is telling us that we can see just how good God is, just how good God is through the good news of Jesus who died um, to save every single person on planet Earth. And so anyone can receive, can receive um, salvation in belie um, by believing in Jesus. Anyone, anyone. And a well-known text, one of the most well-known texts, um, a passage of scripture is John 3, 16. And it simply says, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever, it could be, it could be um, a, a person who has, who has lived um, a crazy life, whatever your, your situation is, God is saying, if you believe in Jesus, if you accept the covenant, um, the, the, the promises, that he, um, the fact that Christ died for you, 
that he will save you. Whosoever believeth in you should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus' death on Calvary is God's way of repaying. I want, I want, I want you to take notice of what I'm about to say. Christ's death, Jesus' death on Calvary is God's way of repaying the debt that we owe to him. So Jesus, God sent Jesus to pay a debt that we owe to God. And God's gift to us is eternal life if we accept Jesus, what Jesus did for us. So I want to just, I want to close, I want to close on, on that point because some of us might be wondering, what can I do to save myself? What can I do to save, to save myself? And the answer to that is nothing. In terms of works, there is nothing that we can do. Only, we can only believe in Jesus and live a saved life. Tell, then we go and we tell somebody else what Jesus has done for me and so that they can experience what we have also found. And so in Steps to Christ, page 103, um, it is written, Sister, Sister White writes this, we must gather about the cross. Every single person must gather about the cross. The cross is where Jesus died. In other words, is what she's saying. Christ and him crucified should be the theme of, of con contemplation, of conversation, and the most joyous emotion. Christ and him crucified should be the theme of our contemplation. Think on it, on, on it meditate on it, and our conversation. And that should give us joy. Just knowing that, 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 that God himself paid the penalty for our sins so that we can receive eternal life. That's, that's, that's joy. That should be our joy, is what, is what the author is saying. We must keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God. And when we realize the, his great love, we should be willing to trust. And there's the word right there, faith. We should be willing to trust everything to the hand of him that was nailed to the cross for us. That was nailed. So Christ died for us. And so because when we realize, when we come to a realization of how much he loves us, how much he cared for us and what he has done for us, we can then trust him and say, you know what? I'm going to give you myself, Jesus. So on that note, I'm going to close and I'm going to pass over, over to um, Monday's lesson thank you pastor that's me <laughs> so um hello to our um, online viewers um the lesson um uh, the part of the lesson on mondays which i'm going to look at is uh entitled the covenant and the sacrifice now pastors touched on a number of areas which um we're going to um, delve into uh, and when I was looking at this um, particular day, it was like, oh, this is really, really big. You know, there's a lot of themes in there which are like, wow, this is amazing. However, for the, in terms of this particular study today, we're just going to focus on a few of those themes. So the covenant and the sacrifice. When I first looked at this particular um, part of the lesson, I was kind of like uh, dumbstruck. I was like, hmm, what does the covenant have to do with sacrifice? What does... Um, uh, having an agree uh, making an agreement or um, you know uh, having an agreement with uh, uh, two parties or many have to do with something uh, someone giving up a particular thing because that's what sacrifice is isn't it being able to have the ability to give up something of value uh, for for a given set of considerations so I think the answer to that question is basically um, found in a part of the Bible um, known as the Book of Exodus the Book of Exodus. And um, in terms of the, what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, a few chapters, namely Exodus chapter 19 through to 24. And this particular um, passage, uh, passage of scripture actually cover um, quite an exciting part of the uh, children of Israel's history. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to try and do my best to summarize what this looks like um, um, in, for, 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 for time's sake. So what we have here is, uh, starting from Exodus 19, is that the children of Israel come out of Egypt, yeah, and basically God says to uh, Moses, look, you know what, I'm going to set up a covenant with you, an agreement, yeah, and basically the reward 
the benefit of this agreement is that, you know what, um, you, the people of uh, Israel, um, he's referring to, will be uh, a chosen people, uh, a, a, a holy nation, a, a, king, a kingdom of uh, priests, if you will, you know, folks who are going to be uh, the conduit through which uh, God actually expresses his uh, intentions and his message to the world, in effect, yeah? And um, the only thing they have to, in essence, do is just basically keep his, the, the agreement. Now, what is the agreement? Now, as we read on um, through the, uh, the rest of the chapters, we discover that this agreement consists of two main things. What's known as uh, the Ten Commandments, um, i.e., you know, uh, don't uh, lie, don't steal, don't cheat, keep the Sabbath. That uh, is what we're referring to as the Ten Commandments, or um, for many, the moral law. But also, in terms of the covenant, it also consists of another set of laws. Yeah, and these laws are referred to generally as uh, speaking as the Mosaic law, or generally the civil laws, uh, like for example, you know how we take care of animals, you know what to do when um, you know uh, things go wrong, that sort of thing. Very much civil activities. Yeah, and what's interesting is you know uh, there's this big massive uh, event which takes place uh, around a place called Mount Sinai. Yeah, and um, the people are there and there's thundering and lightning and wow, it's just this big spectacle and Moses is on the mount and you know what? God is giving him the, uh, this, the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And on, and on top of that, he actually is telling him, look, this is how you're going to run your society in terms of civil laws. Yeah. So after uh, this big um, event, this epic event, you know, it's, 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 it's when the, the, the Bible describes it, it's like, wow, you know, um, the, the people are so afraid at times. It's like, I, I can't believe what's happening. And the, it's so immense that the air is even cordoned off. Yeah. So that folks don't step onto the mountain because they could actually die. You know, that sort of thing. It's really special. It's massive. It's big. Yeah. And, and this is what's happening. And on, and on top of that, after all of this has happened, Moses steps down from the mountain. Yeah. And something interesting happens here. Yeah. He um, says to the people, look, you know what? Um, this is what God has shared with me in terms of the covenant. And here it is. Now, what, what's important to note is that basically before that, they actually, uh, the children of Israel actually agreed to this covenant, even though it, uh, they didn't really know what it was. But this time, look, they've actually been given the details of this covenant. And Moses reads it out to the people. And they once again say, yes, we're going to do it. We're going to uh, adhere to the agreement which you've uh, placed uh, within the, these articles, which have been written and, and given uh, to Moses. Now, what's interesting is the next uh, set of events. Yeah. Now, when um, uh, uh, two parties make an agreement, so to speak, yeah, something special happens now in terms of our modern age um for example if um someone's going to take out a, a contract with bt for their broadband for example uh, they have to sign on the dotted line or or, or or actually seal the agreement in terms of saying well look you know what i adhere to the terms and conditions of the agreement now the same thing happens in the ancient world but what's interesting is this um, animals are sacrificed, yeah, and this is common in the ancient world, yeah. Um, and in, and what happens here is that Moses actually takes uh, the blood of the sacrifice, yeah, and um, basically uh, sprinkles it on the altar, and then he takes the same blood and then sprinkles it on the people themselves as well. Now, and this is all about um, sealing the agreement. Both parties are actually saying, look, look, we agree with the agreement here and we're going to do our part here. Now, what's happening here is that um, the blood being sprinkled on the altar uh, is um, a nod to, to God to say, look, this is God's part of, of it. And uh, the blood being sprinkled on the people is um, uh, uh, the, um, the fact that Moses is saying, look, we as the people of this covenant adhere to these agreements. Now, why blood? 
why blood why is blood used uh to seal an agreement it seems rather gruesome and quite gory and it's like could you just use a pen and just you know write this stuff down on paper no blood is used and it's common in the ancient world it was actually very common uh, because uh, in actual fact um the bible talks about this in the book of uh leviticus yeah and there's a text uh, that i'm just going to briefly read and it's found in um basically um let me see, Leviticus 7, uh, 11. Actually, scratch that, it's not that one. It's, um, there's another text in Deuteronomy 12, verse 23. And, uh, but also there's another text in Leviticus, which I've also forgotten, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back on that. But fundamentally, um, the fact of the matter is life is in the blood, yeah? And uh, the, the fact that blood is used is a symbol of uh, the fact that um, at the end of the day, um uh, blood is a symbol of life yeah now also blood doesn't just symbolize life it symbolizes um cleansing as well which is really interesting so um blood symbolizes life but it also symbolizes cleansing now um what's really interesting is if we look at um leviticus 7 11 which i was going to go to first um but got slightly sidetracked it says here for the life of a creature is in the blood and i have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life yeah also the bible talks about the fact that uh, without the um without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sins Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. So what does it mean to, uh, for something to go in remission? Basically, it means that, you know what, um, something is blotted out, cancelled, cancelled, yeah? It's gone. So the symbolism of the blood is about um, cleansing, and it's also about life. So back to our question, wh what does the, uh, uh, an agreement have to do with a sacrifice? Well, let's look at um, let's look at First uh, Peter uh, eight, 18 verses. Sorry, First Peter uh, one verse eighteen to nineteen. First Peter one verse eighteen to nineteen. I'm just going to read it uh, quickly as we go. So it says, "Knowing uh, this is from the NKG, uh, NKJV, the New King James Version." So it says here, "Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold." Your, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Yeah. So um, what's being said here is, is this, you know, uh, as, uh, as, 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 fo uh, as folk uh, uh, looking at this um, uh, old covenant and this agreement which God had with the people and looking at the imagery and symbolism behind it, Basically, it's saying, look, you know what? Um, we, uh, God had an agreement with you, and that is that you keep his laws, yeah? And, and, that, uh, and the problem is, is that, you know what? Um, if you don't keep the laws, there is a penalty, yeah? And that penalty is death. And this is what the symbolism of the blood is about and sealing uh, the actual uh, the agreement. The fact of the matter is, is that, um, if the agreement isn't kept, yeah, especially in ancient times, you f you would uh, if you forfeited the agreement, your life would be on the line. In other words, your fate would be in the hands of the person who you made the agreement with, and vice versa. So, in actual fact, if you don't, if the agreement wasn't kept, death was on the cards. And it's also talked about in uh, in Romans uh, six verse twenty three as well. You know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I think what's interesting here is also is that, you know, um, the wages of sin, yeah, is death. It's, it's like the consequence of, you know, uh, um, living a life of sin. However, what's really interesting is, you know, the consequence uh, in terms of, I, I guess, what you call, um, actually, let me rephrase that. The, 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 the um, there is nothing, as Pastor said, you can do to uh, inherit eternal life. It's not something you can work your way to. You don't get, yeah, you can't just earn it, you know, and, and you know, um, uh, chalk up lots of points for this kind of stuff. It's not possible, but it's a gift. And uh, Romans uh, 6.23 uh, makes that very clear. 
the, um, um, the, uh, the gift of God is eternal life. So again, going back to this understanding of um, um, what uh, a covenant has to do with, with a sacrifice. Yeah. And it's all about the symbolism of the blood. Yeah. Now, looking at our verse here, which we just read in 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. Yeah. What we can see here is that um, in verse 19, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In other words, um, we are held hostage to the power of sin. But through um, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, yeah, we uh, are uh, that 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 um, that ransom, that redemption has been has been brought through um, to us through Jesus. Yeah. Now, um, so what about the blood? This blood um, it, um, is a symbol of, as we said, life, but also cleansing. Through Jesus' blood, we are um, we have been bought back. From uh, and, and we don't have to uh, suffer the consequences of not um, being, uh, not adhering to the agreement, the covenant, if you will. Yeah. But also we're cleansed as well. In other words, our sins are forgiven. They've been blotted out. And it's like we're, we're, uh, we're all new again. Also, um, just in closing, I'd just like to um, talk about a couple of other things, which is very interesting in terms of looking at this uh, whole understanding of uh, Jesus um, uh, being um, uh, the sacrifice, the one who blots out our sins, and the one who actually um, stops um, the, uh, the consequences of um, uh, uh, us having to die for our sins fundamentally. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing here is in verse 19, it says, also says, um, uh, Je Jesus' precious blood, uh, sorry, let me uh, uh, backtrack, but with the precious blood of Christ and as of a lamb without blemish, yeah. This is, um, this is um, somebody who pays the price for sin, yeah, but in a very unique and specific way, yeah. In other words, um, he's um, likened to a lamb without blemish and spot. What this means is that, you know what? He is actually sinless and blameless. Yeah. Also, um, the fact of the matter is also is that um, he is, um, his precious blood is a symbol of life and he gives his life readily. Now, uh, according to John uh, 10 verse um, 18, um, the Bible talks about um, the fact that Jesus has the authority to um, basically lay his life down and take it up again. Yeah. And I think this is very important uh, in terms of our understanding of the fact that um, G uh, when Jesus paid the price for uh, uh, the sin of mankind, it wasn't just, okay, then, you know, here's two million per quid, go your way type thing. It was very much um, a, 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 a sacrifice which required a, a specific price to be paid and uh, and god through jesus could only pay that yeah so looking at um this again uh, in terms of i'm just going to read um uh john um 10 verses um 17 to 18 and it says here bring this up um the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only I, uh, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. And also, uh, there's another text in First uh, John verse five, um, uh, five, eleven to thirteen. Yeah, which uh, echoes a similar sentiments. Yeah, the fact that. Um, uh, uh, eternal life is found in Jesus. So back to our question again, what is it, uh, what is the connection between the covenant and sacrifice? And it's all to do with Jesus and his shed blood. Yeah, the fact that his, uh, uh, his sacrifice on the cross paid uh, the ransom, the penalty for sin uh, um, from a, an agreement which we didn't or uh, uh, could never keep unless we have um, his, his power in our lives, yeah? And, and the fact that not only um, does he pay the penalty, but he cleanses us from sin as well. Yeah. 
that's me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Now, if you are following the lesson, we, we're now going to move to Tuesday. If you don't have the lesson with you, you can look this up on um, the net, um, just like you access in YouTube here. So if you look at ssnotnet.org, ssnet.org, then you will be able to find the quarter's lesson. And of course, this is lesson number 12. And soon we'll come to the end of this quarter and we'll move on to the third quarter of 2021. So we're on Tuesday and we are looking now, the lesson starts to look at the faith of Abraham and this is part one and you'll see in Wednesday's lesson starts to look at the faith of Abraham part two and the lesson is looking at this character and I just want to ask you or put a statement to you and say it's very easy to believe things are possible when it's sort of obvious okay so you, you know, today it's a very warm day. And I could say, I believe it's going to be warm all day. I have looked at the weather forecast and therefore I'm going to put some washing on the line and they're going to dry. Or I have a box of matches here and I'm going to, right, I trust the matches. I've lit many before and I'm going to believe that if I struck this match, I'm going to get a flame and I'll be able to light the candle. But my question to you is what happens when things seem to be impossible. What happens when you're being made redundant from your job, there are no other jobs around and you know that you've got bills to pay? What is the faith like then? What happens when you're being asked to move out of your home? There are no homes around, you, you don't really have enough money to um, get a mortgage or secure a mortgage. What happens to our faith then? What happens when we have a loved one who is sick or if we really want to have a baby and can't conceive? You know, there are many questions, many things which seem to um, be impossible. And we have the promises of God. And this is what the, this lesson talks about when it's talking about the character of Abraham. Now, what I find very interesting is that it says the title that this is about the faith of Abraham. But when we're looking at Genesis 15, He's not Abraham yet, he's actually Abram. And I think that's a very important point to make. So even if you haven't got access to the um, lesson study or the quarterly, if you do have your Bible or you're able to look on the net too, I'd like us to turn to Genesis 15. If you turn to Genesis 15, of course, this is the first um, chapter of the Bible, the first book in the Bible. We're going to turn to Genesis 15 and we're going to come to the key text, which will be in verse six. But first, I'd like to put this chapter into context. We have seen or we would have read in chapter 14, the heroic escape of Lot and Abraham's family from Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah. Abraham was very heroic and he was able to uh, save the two families. And then of course, we then have chapter 15, which we will come back to. And in chapter 16, we then see the decision that he makes to take Hagar, his handmaid, to then um, create a baby that he later has, has Ishmael. Now in chapter 15, we see this wrestling of Abram with God. He is seeking reassurance from God because he is not a young man and he still has not had a child. Now, when I say he's not a young man, I mean, I say I'm not a young woman, but I'm not as old as Abram at all. He is over 75 here. When he was 70, he was it was promised to him by God that he would have a child. Um, and he's over the age of 75 now, and he still has not been able to conceive a child. And so he's wrestling with God and he's being very honest. And I would say that this is the first lesson that we should take from this character. Sometimes we think that we really shouldn't, even though there's natural human emotions. If we're experiencing any sort of diet as a Christian or a non-Christian, perhaps we shouldn't go to God. But we must remember that God knows all of our thoughts already. And the purpose of prayer is not for God, but for us. The purpose of prayer is to strengthen us so that we can strengthen the communication and to speak about the thoughts, the desires, the worries, the concerns, the joys, um, the, the um, thoughts of thanks with our provider. So God already knows how Abram is feeling. 
And because of the relationship that Abram has, he goes to the Lord with his worries and concerns, and he's seeking reassurance in wholehearted honesty. And if you were to look at um, Genesis 15 verses 2 to 3, then you would see those expressions there. As we move through the chapter, we then see God's response. God responds, and you know, if you've done a study on prayer, God always does respond. He can say yes, um, it could be if, if we have a request, he may say no, or he might be getting us to wait. And in the waiting, there's much that we can learn. But we learn in this chapter that God responds to Abraham and he's speaking to him about how he's going to fulfill his promises. You know, he tells him to go out and look at the stars outside and that the fact that they're uncountable. And this is how many descendants he's later on going to go and have. And then we come to the key verse in this chapter. This is, I'm going to read from the King James Version. This is Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. And, and so the he that we're referring to is Abram. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And this is what we're just going to take a few minutes to look at together uh, during this section. Now, this is one of the key ideas in Christianity. In fact, this is the first time in the Bible that we see the word believe, and we also see the word righteousness. Now, the reason uh, you can see here, it says, I'm going to just read, and he believed in the Lord. We're not talking about the sort of belief where he believes that God is real. You know, you will speak to many people who believe that God is real. They believe that Jesus, yes, he was on this earth and, and he did a lot of miracles and he did a lot of good things and he was a real historical person. This is not the sort of belief that we are, are talking about. The belief that is being expressed here is the fact that Abram believed God's word. He believed him. It's not about believing he was real. He believed that he, what he said would come to pass. You know, I think there's a text in Numbers where it says that God is not a man that he would lie. And so Abram has clinged on to the promise here that if God has told me this, then I am going to believe it. Even though I'm over the age of 75, I'm going to look up into the stars and I am going to have these innumerable descendants. And that's the first thing that we need to try and cultivate. It's very important to note that this um, belief didn't just appear out of nowhere. You know, I've, I've previously, I've done a lot of road traffic accidents and I have spoken to people about what happened and they will have, they have stated to me on a number of occasions that even though they have had, there is a straight road, you know, you can see it straight left and also right, that when they pulled out, the car came out of nowhere. I'm afraid that's not possible. What we're dealing here with is with someone who didn't look. And so what we see with Abram, this belief didn't just turn up. He has cultivated it before this time. And this is one of the key lessons that we need to learn as Christians or, or believers in Jesus. And as we cultivate our relationship with God, we really need to, in our daily experience with him, cultivate that belief. We cannot suddenly wait until something is great and big to think, right, I didn't believe you in that little thing, Lord. But now when they're going to sack me because I won't work on the Sabbath, I'm going to stand up for you. So it's about the little things. Sometimes the creeping compromises can um, creep in and we start to compromise our beliefs because we believe we're not seen or because we believe it's a little thing, but we need to stand firm. And these things will build us up to the place that Abram got to in chapter 15. So we've got there, we've got the words, we've got the Lord's promise and we've got the assurance of the Lord and the fact that Abram believed him. Now, the text goes on to say that, and he, now this is talking about God, you can see it's capital H, so it's talking about God, he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, as I've said before, in chapter 14, Ab Ab Abram was heroic. It wasn't when he finally rescued Lot and his family and his own family from Sodom and Gomorrah that the Lord said to him, that was so brave of you. What you did there was absolutely excellent. And now I'm going to account my righteousness to you. 
it wasn't at that point. It was here in chapter 15, in the midst of his doubts, in the midst of his concerns, in the midst of his worries, that when he chose to believe God at his word, the Lord said, yes, that is it. It is your faith. Because of your faith, I am going to account to you my righteousness. And again, this is one of the key lessons of Christianity. It doesn't matter how heroic we are. It doesn't matter how excellent we think we've been or how good we've been or whatever good deed we've done. It's not that which actually gets us righteousness. It is our firm belief in God. You know, if we were to go on and to look in, in the New Testament, we are told that our righteous, our own righteousness as humans are as filthy rags. When you look at that word, when we say filthy, I'm not just talking about a little bit of dirt. Um, if you go into the study of that word, and I don't mean to be too crude, but the, the reference in the word is, is talking about a woman's menstrual cloth. That is how filthy our righteousness is to God. There's nothing we can do that can save ourselves. It is only God himself that can give us his righteousness. You know, there's, there was a word here, um, the reference to the word imputed. And if you impute something, it means you're giving it over. However, the person or the thing that's given it over has to be something of very high value or it's worthless. So God in his own righteousness, in his own glory, so, you know, so glorious that when Moses went to get the Ten Commandments, he had to shield himself because he couldn't look at him. So, so righteous, uh, if we think about Moses again, that when he's at the burning bush, you know, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. This is the righteousness of God. There are so many stories. His own righteousness, the glory of God, he has given to us by faith and faith alone. Now that is really quite something that we can um, get salvation by great grace. In God's word here, it is a very, very clear expression of truth of salvation by grace through faith and faith alone. This also, this expression, you know, there may be some people who don't believe in, in the Old Testament, but this expression is later taken on through into the New Testament. So if you were to look up, and I'll just give you some time to note this down because time isn't on our side, but if you note these references as well, Romans 4 verses 1 to 3, you'll see this reference here. Romans 4 verses 9 to 10, you will see again this reference here. Romans 4 verses 19 to 24, and we'll read this one in a moment. And Galatians 3 verse 5 to 7. So when we're looking at the word of God, the Bible, the word of God is very holistic. You know, this is not just a throwaway comment to Abraham and Abraham alone. There is Abraham, sorry, and Abraham alone. It's gone later on, not only to Abraham, but to his descendants and also to us, to you who are listening, to those who are not listening. And I'm so thankful that this is also for me. Now, may I ask just someone in the panel, could you read for us? Romans 4 verses 19 to 24. Romans 4 verses 19 to 24. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now, now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise. So of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was able to also perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to, unto him, but also, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. For we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
Thank you very much. Now we're going to be in situations because, you know, look at the time that we're living in and we're also human. Sometimes the biggest battle is the battle that we have with ourselves. I note in the text there that we have the word staggered. Sometimes we're going to feel battered. We're going to feel bruised. Sometimes we're not even walking through life. We truly are staggering. But it was the strong faith of Abram that carried him through. And I'm going to encourage every, every one of us listening here today that whether we be battered and bruised the Lord God himself will carry us through and all we need to do is believe. Sometimes we need to be put in a situation where we we are completely helpless so that we cannot say under any circumstances at all that it was us that that brought us from A to B. You know look at Abraham, Abraham, if you notice he wasn't circumcised his circumcision didn't happen until chapter 13. Circumcision is very important. And it was, it was a, again, a token of the covenant when it was fulfilled. He was then circumcised as an old man when he was 100. So we cannot even look at the text and say, oh, no, actually, Abram was actually righteous before because that's not the case. We can't even look at Abram and say that he was a perfect man. Because yes, this chapter comes in between his heroic act and then his moment of weakness and desperation when he took his handmaiden to take things into his own hands. And yet God who is all knowing, God who knows the beginning um, to the end still imputed his righteousness on Abram. So even when we're helpless, even when, when we think that we, we are so bad or that we've done so much, know that God has imputed his righteousness onto him, onto us, sorry. And if we just believe, take hold of his hands, that will save us. Now, I'm not saying that th that doesn't mean that we won't go on to do other things, because I believe that once we get into a relationship with God, we will want to do good things for him. So our works will follow. However, we must know that it is not those works or the things that we do that give us our righteousness. We need to have complete surrender. It must be total submission to God. And we also need to have faith followed by obedience. And that's what this lesson brings out. We're not looking at a perfect man. We're looking at the man, Abram, who was later changed to Abraham, the father of the nation, the one, one of the patriarchs mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 of having such great faith. He, this wasn't brought out into the lesson because he's that dissimilar to us, but to encourage us that a mere mortal such as him can be an example to us in this day and age. And for that, I praise God. Thank you, Javinia. So going on to Wednesday's portion of the lesson study, uh, the title, as Javinia said, is The Faith of Abraham, Part 2. Um, and we'll begin with Genesis 15, verse 16, which is the verse we've been unpacking with Javinia just moments ago, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over it and emphasize and, and bring home that message. Um, so there might be a bit of repetition, but that's okay. So Genesis 15, verse six reads, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So regarding this righteousness, and being accounted for righteousness. The book, Selected Messages, um, first, selected, first Selected Messages, page 367, says this, the only way in which he, the sinner, can attain to righteousness is through faith. By faith, he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the, the obedience of his son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure, and God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. This is how faith is accounted righteousness. So like Abraham, when the believer applies these elements of faith that we've just learned about um, 
through previous days of this lesson study and in this quote as well, um, we can then be accounted as righteous. Um, and we can also see that that righteous, we're accounted righteous because we're applying the merits of Christ. And that's, that's how we get to that place. And just unpacking this word accounted a little bit as well. In the concordance, it um, comes up to, it's defined as esteem, calculate, reckon, value, regard. And um, the author also explains that it means a person or thing um, is, a, is reckoned or regarded as something that a person or thing is not. So counted, when, when Abraham count, is counted for righteousness, um, he's reckoned for something that he is, uh, he's reckoned for something that he isn't, but um, at the same time, the Lord is um, putting the, applying the merits of Christ there, so that's how he gets there. Um, and that word reckoned as well in the dictionary, Oxford Dictionary, comes up as to be considered or regarded in, an, in a specified way. So let's see what this whole conversation is that God has with Abraham um, in, in verses two, um, from verses two in, in Genesis 15. So Abraham says to God, um, and Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless? The steward of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Behold, the word of the Lord, verse four, uh, came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be verse six and he believed in the lord and he counted it to him for righteousness so that's the promise that was made that's the that's the conversation that when took place between god and abraham in regards to this um to, to this prophecy if you'd like for what is what abraham is to expect in some time to come um so we see in verse we see in verse for that God makes this promise and then Abraham doubts and questions it no Abraham's response um, in verse six is he counts it regards it reckons it as done um, and even though Isaac isn't birthed immediately um, Abraham's belief is that God said it it's done that's the end of it which is, is, which is a nice lesson, really, a nice takeaway for me personally in regards to this, this, this Abrahamic walk that we, we should be partaking of. Um, and we see this concept of to account um, in other places in the Bible. So we'll look at a few of them. Um, Genesis 31, 15. So Genesis 31, 15. Um, And it reads, 15, we are not counted of him strangers, for he hath sold us and have and have quite and have uh, quite devoured also our money. So here we see that Rachel and Leah stating that their father reckons or regards them as strangers when they're not, because we see that this this phrase or this word counted is to to see something for something it isn't and that's what Rachel and Leah are doing here in regards to their dad um, same situation is seen in numbers 18 27 and I'll just read that quickly for time numbers 18 27 it reads and this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press. So the tithe of the Levite is reckoned or regarded as the corn of the threshing floor, but clearly it's not. Um, so just circling back to the memory verse chapter, Galatians 3, um, regarding 
this um, accounting for righteousness. Galatians 3 verse 6. Galatians 3 verse 6 and it reads even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness verse 11 but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God it is evident for the just shall live by faith and the law is not of faith but the man that doeth them shall live in them Okay, so again, just in, in, the, in the concept of the faith of Abraham, we see a few different things happening in these verses. So verse six, Abraham believes. And this, what does this belief look like? This, or it leads to, it leads to him being accounted as righteous. And in verse 11, we see that, um, you know, this, this being accounted by righteous is linked to living by faith. And we can see that in Abraham's life and in his journey as he moves, moves from place to place because God told him to. And then the last verse, verse 12, depicts that the man that doeth, um, as outlined above, is righteous, just, and faithful. So these verses are showing us the, you know, the, the workings of Abraham's faith and the outcome there, thereof as well. Um, but just to further add to this, the book Third Selected Messages, um, page 191, reads, When through repentance and faith we accept Christ as our Saviour, the Lord pardons our sins and remits the penalty pres prescribed for the transgression of the law. The sinner then stands before God as a just person. He is taken into favour with heaven and through the Spirit has fellowship with the Father and the Son. There is yet another work to be accomplished, and this is a of a progressive nature. The soul is to be sanctified through the truth, and this also is accomplished through faith. For it is only by the faith of Christ, no, sorry, for it is only by the grace of Christ which we receive faith that the character can be transformed. So this is another layer of um, Abraham's faith, because as Javinia um, explained, Abraham had a transform, you know, had some transforming to do. He had, he was on a journey in, on so many levels. Um, and so this also shows us um, another aspect of his faith in regards to the fact that his character also needed a bit of work and some transforming to do. And Abraham's example of faith shows us the various mechanics of righteousness. Like Abraham, the true believer is transformed by grace through faith. And likewise, let us all by faith um, have, well, we all have a measure of faith and no matter how big or small it is. And, but let us utilize that faith in order for us to achieve and maintain the Abrahamic walk that we need with God. I'll end here and hand over to Errol. Thank you for that, Marie. Um, today, my, my, um, my uh, focus today is on, is, is on Thursday's lesson. Thursday's lesson, which is titled, Resting on the Promises, Resting on the Promises. Now, if we look at the word rest, look at the word rest, we see, uh, a quiet repose, I like that meaning, a quiet repose, a quiet repose. We could say contemplation, a quiet repose on contemplation, yeah? Now, if we look at the word promise, resting on the promises, promise, a promise is an assurance of grounds of expectation. A promise is an assurance of grounds of expectation. So we could say then that contemplation on the assured grounds of expectation, what's the grounds of expectation? the promises of God, yeah? Contemplation on the promises of God. We could say contemplation on the covenant, provenant promises of God, okay? 
Now, we've, we've, we've spoken uh, before in earlier lessons about various covenants. We have uh, the Edenic covenant, the covenant promise, yeah? Um, we have the Noahic, um, the Abrahamic, as Javinia uh, um, spoke of earlier. We have the Mosaic, we have the Levitical, and we have the Davidic. Now we also have the new covenant or the gospel covenant, which speaks of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Now, if we look at the, the, the lesson, there's a little writing here and it says, there is a story told about the famous Cardinal Bellamarine, the great Catholic apologist who all his life fought the message of justification by imputed righteousness alone. And it says here, as he lay dying, he was brought the crucifixes and the merits of the saints to help give him assurance before death, which was their practice. But it says here, but Bella Marie said, take it away. He says, I think it's safer to trust in the merits of Christ. Take it away. I think it's safer to trust in the merits of Christ. Resting on the promises. Now, the whole covenant is based on the secure promises of God. So the promises of God are secure. Okay. Now, if we look at Jeremiah 11, verse 8, Jeremiah chapter 11, and verses 8. Let's go from verse 6. It reads, then the Lord said unto me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, hear ye the words of this covenant and do them. It says, for I earnestly protest, for I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Okay, so we could say that the covenant was broken. Now, if we go to Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20, Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20, and it reads, and the reason why we go here, it's, it's, it's alluding to the fact that the old covenant was broken, so God is promising a new covenant. And it says, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep mine ordinances, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, so... It's not relying on the people themselves to keep the covenant. God was going to imp impute it into their hearts. Okay. Now how does he do that? Well, I, 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 spo I um, spoke of the gospel covenant, the new covenant. And uh, as has been mentioned earlier, the new covenant, the good news. Good news about who? The good news of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. Okay. Now, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, let's let's go back a bit. If we look at Psalms, let's look at Psalms thirty-four, verse eight. Psalms thirty-four. Psalms 34, verse 8, and it reads,
Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's start at, at three. This is David speaking. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were ashamed. It says, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. It says here, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And trusts in who? Who trusts in the Lord. So, well, it's, 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 it, David is encouraging us to, um, he's telling us of, of experiences that have happened before. And we see evidence of experiences. And because of that, he's encouraging, um, encouraging readers, encouraging us, encouraging me, encouraging you. So that instead of depending on the word of others, we are, to, we are encouraged to taste for ourselves and see that the Lord is good through experience. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, John 15, 24, if we look at John 15, 24, it tells us to ask, ask and you shall receive. Ask what? Now, if we look at some of these texts here, if we look at Matthew eleven thirty, 30, Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, It says, eleven verse thirty. But let's let's start from verse twenty six. Verse twenty six, and it says, "Even so, Father, for for so it seemed good in Thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son." but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal, to, whom the, 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 to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he goes on, goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of who? Learn of Jesus. For I am meek and lowly, meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For it says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ urges us to lay our burdens upon him. The savior of the world and to bear his yoke. Christ has died for us. You know, he, he, he became sin. He took on our sin. But we can put on the righteousness of God. How does that work? I relate that to an eclipse between a, a, a lunar eclipse. Now, we have the sun. And when the sun, when the moon is, when the moon is directly between the sun and the earth, the earth is eclipsed. It's eclipsed by the moon. Yeah. Now, this is what Christ does for us. Christ stands in, Christ stands in the presence, Christ stands in the, in the, in the presence of his father. And as our prayers go up to him he stands in the present his father sees the son he doesn't see us and he sees the son's right righteousness and that is um imputed to us as righteousness now javinia spoke earlier on about um our righteousness our righteousness um are like filthy rags but without Christ, without what he has done, without 
the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And without the faith that we have in what he has done for us. Because of that, his father sees the righteousness of his son. And that is imputed to us as righteousness. So that's going back on to resting on the promises. These are the, some of the promises that Christ has given to us in the new covenant. Okay, thank you very much. I would, go as, I would go as far as to say, there are a few more texts, but I would go as far as to say that as we meet the conditions of God's covenant promises in Christ, and as we wait in hope for his return, we shall experience eternal life. We shall experience eternal life as citizens of his heavenly kingdom. So let us hope on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Arrow, and thank you, everyone. So we're about to close. What I'm looking for is just a roundup from every, every um, panelist of what, a summary of what you got from the lesson. I want to start with, um, with Richard on Monday. I think uh, from my uh, perspective, in terms of um, what I've got from um, my portion of the lesson is that um, the price which Jesus uh, paid for um, uh, redeeming or uh, ransoming um, he, human beings from sin was immense, you know, so much so that he, pay, uh, he paid with his life. But um, he, his um, sacrifice is so special that uh, as someone who is sinless, but has um, eternal life um, within him, he's the person who could actually do that effectively on our behalf. And that's really amazing. And interesting enough as well, the blood which uh, symbolizes uh, life and the cleansing uh, of sin, yeah, um, has this duality to it. What um, is could be seen as a consequence for not keeping an agreement actually is the very thing which actually goes ahead and actually redeems us. So it's really fascinating how that, that whole kind of duality uh, works. So yeah, that's uh, fascinating, certainly to me, and it blew my mind. Wonderful, thank you. And now over to Javinia. Thank you. Um, the lesson for me, every lesson we study is about practical, not just theoretical application. I think from the life of Abraham, we can learn to go to God and be honest with him, share our thoughts, even when we do have our doubts. On a daily basis, we should build up our faith relationship with him so that when the rubber really does meet the road, we can cling on to the faith that we've built. Take God at his word and believe him when he speaks to us. Know that there is nothing that we can do in terms of actions to gain our own righteousness. When we fall, you know, when, when we are sinners, when we fall, we must get back up, go to God, ask for forgiveness and press on, keep, keep going. And finally, we should surrender, submit and be obedient to God and be faithful in the things that we do. Thank you. Amazing. Now over to Maria for Wednesday. Thank you. So for Wednesdays, um, I think what stood out to me is that we shouldn't find ourselves being put off by, by what we can see uh, or how impossible things can appear, um, but rather to focus on the unfailing word of God um Abraham was given a promise and it wasn't actioned immediately and you know there was a, a whole journey to get in Isaac and, and you know it you know Isaac wasn't the first um child that he had as soon as he had that promise um but even though God did say that you're you know you're going to have this child and it's the same for us sometimes we get put off by the fact that what we are promised or what we expect or what we know of God isn't exactly what we're seeing in that very moment. But nevertheless, um, we still need to, like Abraham, stand firm on the promises and continue trusting in his process, continue trusting in the, in the fact that, um, you know, he is on time. He's an on-time God. And so our part in all of this is the fact that we need to just, you know, 
maintain that faith, grow that faith, cultivate that faith, receive um, that, you know, that increase in, you know, that measure of faith that we are supposed to be able to have in order for us to get to that place where we, we, we receive the promises um, in the way that God um, has planned for us to receive them. That's it. Thank you. Now over to Errol. Okay, my day was Thursday, resting on the promises. Now the ultimate promises, the ultimate promise, sorry. If we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet, prom, the Old Testament prophecies were pointing to Calvary, to Jesus. In our time, we look back to Jesus. Okay. Now Christ lived a righteous, a perfect life for our sins. He was persecuted for good works. And he was unjust, unjustly sentenced to death. An, an unlawful sentence to death. And after, he was raised after three days, as he promised. If you, if you, if you take this, this temple and break it down, I will rebuild it in three days. He was talking about his body temple. He rose. After three days, as he said, as he prophesied, he did. He ascended to heaven, which was witnessed by his disciples. And as it was witnessed by his disciples, there was an angel, the angel stood by and said to him, the same Jesus who you see ascending, the same shall return again. And so we wait on the promise and our hope of his soon return. He's coming again to those who are waiting and preparing for his soon return. So we can be encouraged by that. And once again, as I said, um, we meet, as we meet the conditions of God, of God's covenant, the promise which is in Jesus Christ himself, faith in Jesus Christ. Or shall I say again, grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. In Christ, and as we wait in hope of his return, we shall experience once again eternal, uh, eternal life as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. Thank you, Errol. And so in closing, I just want to say to everyone that has watched, thank you for watching. And um, I hope that you've received something from, from, from today's, today's study. And like we said earlier, um, like Javina said earlier, I just want to reiterate the point. If you want to follow us, if you got something from this lesson and you want to follow us in future lessons, please visit ss.net. That means sabbathschool.net and where you can download the, um, the Sabbath school lesson and follow on. So the lesson really is, is, is showing us that, that God is the one who imputes righteousness um, in those who, who believe in him. And we can do nothing of ourselves to, to, do, um, to earn the favor, to work ourselves into the kingdom or to earn the favor um, of, of, of God. And um, I just want to, to just reiterate what the lesson showed us. The lesson demonstrated that Abraham, and it came out so clearly that Abraham um, by, by Maria and Jovinia, that Abraham believed God and, be, and, and that belief in God was, um, is what God used to impute righteousness unto him. And as the lesson also brought out, that, it not, that this doesn't just apply to Abraham, it applies to all of us. It applies to you, it applies um, to, to myself. And so God will give us, and, and, and when God gives us his righteousness, he also gives us the power to live a righteous life and be able to, to keep our side of the covenant that is keeping his 10 commandments, his 10 commandments law. And so we're gonna close now um, um, with everyone. And I want us to just to close with a word of prayer. And I'm gonna ask Richard, please, just to close, close us off with a word of prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time where we've been able to uh, study your word. We thank you for, uh, all the panelists who have taken part and how you've uh, blessed each and every one to share a word from you. At this time, I pray that uh, you would um, 
bless um, what has happened here. And I pray that um, someone out there will receive uh, what is um, being provided here and it will have an impact upon their lives, Lord. I pray that you would continue to bless this ministry and I pray that it will go from strength to strength. Thank you for this time. Thank you for all these wonderful people on this platform. And thank you for being with us at this time. Bless us as we go um, and as we finish um, today's um, program uh, this, at this time. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all for watch, watching and see you next time by God's grace.